This session of Keenan Architecture in the Modern Master sequence of 10 consecutive draw along lectures on the four modern masters is about the Villa Savoy. Uh, S A V O Y E in French is pronounced Villa Savoy. It's a modernist villa and uh, can be found in Poissy, which is a suburb of Paris, just on the outskirts, and designed by the Fr Swiss French architect Le Corbusier. Uh, Le Corbusier is not a family name. It's not a name of any sort. It is an object type. He was born Charles Generet in Switzerland. Then she became an architect in his home area and came to France later on in life and then got involved in international style ideas. And his five points of architecture were sort of seminal in the, in the growth of the modern movement. He believed so much in the idea of typology that the house is an object type, much like a pen or glasses or shoes are devices that are totally functional and that inherently have that beauty because of their functional, functional scheme. So he needed ideas designed to be justified in design and in urban terms as well. So he changed his name to The Corbusier, which is kind of a mix between uh, a partial family name as well as the word crow in French, which he kind of looks like as a tall person dressed in black, hunched over a drafting table from the side, looked like a crow. So he became this object type of somebody who creates object types. So in his house for living, his machine for living at the Villa Savoy here, we'll talk about the five principles that can be found in many of his works. So we'll come back to the Villa Savoy in a second. We'll be drawing it from this vantage point. Uh, and let's see right here. There's no real front elevation to it. It's all um, based on the performance of these five key aspects. And we'll show them here in the Villa Savoy. We'll go back to some of his work that built up to this project and then how he continued on until the Great Depression kind of tamped down on architecture across the Western Hemisphere. So number one is there's going to be pelotes or ways to lift the building up off the ground. So you get away from the deleterious nature of the moisture and the dirt and the trappings of being on ground floor and much like traditional uh, European residential architecture. This is referred to as the Piano Nobile. And so they consider this as floor number one, two, three, and four moving forward. So this is floor zero down below. He wanted to accentuate that by raising the house and expressing the raising by showing the Pelotes down below. In this case, the Pelotes also have a feature that the um, space between the Pelotes in their scale of these five laid out here allow for a car to drive underneath the home and then drop off people at the front door here and then return over here to the right and then park in garage spaces underneath over here. So the automobile is a great object type to move people is integrated into the actual architecture of the home as part of it moving forward. The next is a functional roof. Coming after World War II, the idea of flight became much more commercial and popular so that he believed that not only do you have four elevations you're responsible for, we also now have a fifth that's seen from the sky. So in a sense, that is your last element of sort of a portraiture of the home from above. So that should be a reclaiming spot for nature, the land occupied by the building to have a, a serving a garden and a terrace above. So it's a functional roof now, and not just a place that sheds water. Inside all the floor plans, number three is the free floor plan. So you don't have load bearing walls. It's all points on columns. So it frees up any type of functional need on the inside of the space. Number four are long horizontal windows because we do not see vertically in punches of windows. Our eyes are set horizontal. So our view shed is along the horizon line. And so that key aspect that is run across the entire house in a uniform aspect, no matter what the interior space is behind it. And then finally, because you have a freedom of structure, there's no need to uh, keep any type of structural reference beyond the column grid itself. So it also frees up to design facades. So it's merely a skin for the walls and windows and unconstrained by load bearing considerations. 
So those are the five points that he builds to, to his kind of key aspect here at the Middle Savoy. And we also saw in earlier projects in his career, the Maison Citroën, which is a play off the word Citroën, which is a car dealership in France, car manufacturer. And so he tries to make the home a tool of devices which provides the idea of living. Much like a paper clip is iconic, the home should become iconic in terms of something that services and then inherently it must be beautiful rather than trying to apply decoration or ornament to it. And the same is true for the Villa Garge here, which has sort of a formal quality on the front in terms of its reception of people, the golden section here in spirit. Then the backside, it opens up to the garden, becomes much more functionally and uh, allowing the indoor outdoor movement of space. So he moves from the uh, latter part of the teens all the way up until 1929 with the Villa Savoy in that decade, he creates a series of these modern epics and we're going to dive deep into the Villa Savoy today. So again, our view shed is from this front corner. The car comes in from the access off the street, drives around, and in its radius, which is designed for the radius of the particular car the, that the homeowners had, then the drop-off point is here. We'll articulate that later with green detail. But basically, the entire home is intended to be white, uh, inside and outside, so that your objects that you collect on the inside are the real kind of showcase, almost as if the home itself is a, a gallery for your lifestyle. So this is for Mr. and Mrs. Savoy, again, between 1928 and 1931. The ideal was, as many architects projected at the time, to make it out of reinforced concrete, kind of monolithic, but because it, that was sort of a newer material, the Beton Brew, the French had sort of invented in the latter part of the last century into the 20th century, to bring it down to this scale in a single family residence was just cost prohibitive. So much like other ones that seem like they look like the reinforced concrete, this too is also blocked up with individual units and then skim coated to appear like it's monolithic. So if we come back into this really quickly, we can ascertain from these lines that are pre-drawn for you that the horizon line is at head height here as somebody approaches and walks up to the space of the building. So anything we add extra has to go back and you'll see because we're so close to it, the vanishing points are far off to the left and far off to the right. But again, the base of all of our columns in the front line here will vanish back to those points to the corner and then back to the right point. Well, that's as we'll draw those down to meet the grass base beneath. It's uh, sort of a a stone rubble bay down here for the garage turnaround. And then once you get to the edge of the perimeter of the pilotes, it becomes a, a grass platen for the couple who own the building. So we'll also come back in and do sort of just uh, generically because it's behind the, the building, sort of a non very specific greenery of the, the trees that were planted and now are a, sort of a small forest that engulfs the space. And we'll let that rise against our white volumes that he has playfully on top here. And then we'll move it about the back side. So we'll be able to, again, our key aspect for any type of building is to see the exterior skin to move to the interior. And if possible, in this case, you move in and then leave to another set of windows to see this green come through the building. So things like this little detail there and over on that side are very important in terms of creating that transparency. And then they'll come all the way down to our horizon line. And then we'll show the structure of the trees meeting that horizon, the distance over here. And then maybe a little bit less. On this side is there also our different types of plantings that we'll see come around the back side of the lot. So we'll draw on shrubs later on at the base to give a secondary scale. And then the lawn will simply go to our horizon line and out to the front. So the first thing we can do, because the whole building is white, we'll assume the paper will be our, our, our basic key keystone of white for us, is to mix a shadow line. And we'll simply take all the whites now and move them through that kind of black blue shadow we used in prior sketches so far with watercolor. So come to your water base and start to build a pool of that blue black.
And again, I'll be using this a lot so we can put in a lot of water to start in this pool. And then mix in one to two to potentially three different blues as a base. And then some of the panes gray or black you might have in your pads. Make sure there's enough water. Um, it's okay to remix later, but it's it makes it faster for you if you sort of overmix in the beginning and have residual shadowing value later. And that might be enough to start with here. And now because we've got a lot of area to work with, we're going to move into the chisel point brushes. So we're going to follow what the, the photograph here, the image here shows that the southern side is being lit. So it's not quite towards the afternoon. It's probably mid-morning. And so the western elevation doesn't have much light enough. So this will be all grayed out in a sense with our blue. We'll make it even for now. We can make it more specific later on, but to the corners. And simply bring that approach all the way to the edge. You should have a lot of control because it's a wet wash on dry paper. All across the bottom. And don't worry about crossing over the structure for the windows because those will go to black later on. And any type of imperfection in the stroke of the brush or the way the water moves across the paper or the paper itself will kind of give the idea of the concrete skin of this, the kind of stuccoing over the block, have kind of the aging effect of concrete over time. You have a little patina to the material. And we'll do the same too for all the columns coming down that don't receive light. As you can see here, we will work with the sun being low enough in the morning to cut through at an angle and light some of the ones that are actually behind the front columns on this side's on the west side to have a little glimpse of light hit at the base. So we'll take that wash for the this left side for the ones that are deep in the back and won't receive direct light at all and take those down to grade. And now this fourth one is the one that's going to receive a little bit of light from the angle of inclination of the sun. So we'll start it here and then just stop it right at about three quarters of the way down. And then we'll leave this one full in the sun. One in the back is also actually going to be in shade, but it also has a little bit of light that hits that. And we move back, we see the skin then come around of the, the green base, which will take us back the whole length behind the columns. And so these will be brightly lit. This whole facade will be brightly lit. And now we can go up to the top and use the gray to show the movement of light across these hemispherical shapes up here. So this plane is all blue. That's certain per, uh, parallel to the walls down below. It's got an opening for a view to the west for the people who are up on the deck. And now from this end, we'll simply start with the blue and then we'll add water to it so it goes from the blue on the edge and becomes brighter and brighter and brighter as it turns the bend here. So we can start with the pigment here on the edge. And move that an inch or an inch and a half. And then from there, go back and clean out the brush with water. And now just add water as it dissipates towards the front. Wash out the brush, do it again, 
and that'll give a nice sort of definition of it modulating across the curve on that front skin. Same thing happens here is that the little bit of front here, it'll be darker in the left corner. And it'll run further because this is even deeper away from the direct sunlight, but right towards this right edge, it'll fan back to the white of the page. So again, we just add water to that edge and let it dissipate out so that it's brightest right there. So now we get a little bit more of the movement of light kind of framing our shape of the architecture. So here now is the column on the backside, which is completely in the shadow. We see a little bit of a column here behind this one. So the five on this side stack back on both sides. It's a five by five version of these columns, which creates a perfect square and plan. And then he kind of um, bifurcates that, moves things and has mechanical geometric symbols on the inside that are shaping the room's layout. So they're functionally sort of neutral in terms of their image, but they're tied into the geometry of the whole complex. Now we also see with the interior rooms, which have white ceilings as well, we see the inside of these before we get back to the trees going through there as being a darker tone of white because it's not receiving light. And that goes up to a certain point where the inside walls come down. So that's through the windows and against that inside wall. So because those are white walls as well, and they're not receiving light, they get the same valuation of, again, our blue-black, which will show behind the glazing here, there's a mass. And that mass comes all the way up to an open pocket, a cavity on that piano nobile, the first floor there. And then we'll see a side of the ramp that leads up to the upper deck. And so that'll be darker here at the underside of it. And as the deck rises, it's going up to light that's going over this pitch into a courtyard area and then lighting that edge of the deck as it moves up to people up to the top deck here. Same is true for the other side as we look through the windows here. The ceiling through the columns will get that initial valuation. And the same is true for what we see beyond this one which is actually not glazed. These are glazed into an interior. This is glazed. This is not glazed, so it's just an open space, but we now see the outside wall that's facing west. So this is parallel to this wall, so it has that same tone. And then we see something similar over here where there's a play of a wall, which rises to the height of that courtyard which also faces west. So we leave a little bit of that white there to show that's actually sky now. So we'll be able to put the green right above that area as being behind the building. And now the other side of the whole space, again, this is one of the more uh, simpler in terms of tone and color because it's all monolithically white intentionally. That underside is completely without light directly on it. So we'll simply wash that across. So now we've have assigned values to all the principal elements here. We'll shift in tone and color, and now we'll do our, our two zones of green, which are gonna be the natural green, the trees behind, and the grass esplanade at the base of it. And then the green that's a little bit deeper, a richer sort of uh, green with fenestration inside of it with the bending of the metallic type of skin for the automobile down below. So let's first start with our, our backdrop and then we'll work our way deeper and deeper toward the underside. So in another pool over here, we need to start again with a lot of water, maybe even use the one inch brush to bring more water over quicker. 
is we're going to do just simply sheets of tone of green to the backdrop to start with. And again, it's not, it's, it's definitely in the backdrop. So it's sort of secondary. So we don't need a lot of definition with it initially. We'll define it more as it comes closer to the home. And again, to stop down any green, just add a little bit of red to it and you sort of get a natural brown that way. Kind of warms up the green. And there are trees in the backdrop, so they're not as colorful as you'd see if it was sunlit in the foreground. And make sure that's very sloppy and wet because we want to move it quickly across a large area. And we'll test the color. That seems appropriate. So now to cover area quick, we'll move over to the mid-range flat brush. And we'll come to the edge of our white here. We want to have vegetation really pull that white off the page by encircling the whole edge there. So I'll move it out of the way so we can put the pigment in. And we'll start and make a strong line right at the edge of the home. And just up to the corner to anchor that part of the home with value. And then we'll go back into it, do some definitions so you can have strokes. It doesn't have to be a flat plane. We'll take it all the way over to the edge and down to the horizon line for now. Same thing on this side of it. We'll come to the edge of the blue and we'll wash in the green right to the edge of the roof terrace. And we'll take it down to the horizon line. And then critical to show the transparency of that lower level, we're going to take it right through the base and drop it down to the vista of the horizon line. It's a little bit small in some of these spaces, so we'll switch to the fine point pen, uh, brush. And now we've got that zone sort of articulated on this side. We'll finish that by coming to the underside and bringing that down to the horizon line. So now we have the subject, we've got the backdrop, we've got some transparency between that. We can come back in now and look at the interior and say that we know there is a little bit of a, turn, a return of the wall here. Look at the other side and from that point over, we can show the green of the trees coming through and that will go a certain distance and then the wall becomes opaque again right about here. So that's all the same as the background. So now we see that transparency by showing the subject above it, inside of it, and beneath it. And we do the same thing over here, that there will be a wash of green eventually. We'll, we'll beef up with detail and value to make it really important to show the connectivity to the landscape here. And now we'll take the green that we've got started here and we can add to it or we can do a separate one for it because now the grass green is going to be a little bit more yellowed and a brighter green. So you've got the residual in the backdrop being more of a vertical wall of darker, um, deeper tone greens and the grass being a little bit more brilliant. So if we start another pool to reshape a different type of green... Probably going straight from any pad is probably too strong because a lot of times the graphics we buy at art stores are really for a whole range of arts like graphic design and fabrics and different types of products that need very bold strident things. The architectural world is very bland and sort of earthen. So whatever tone you strike, you want to sort of cut the veracity of the value inside that. 
So let's try this now to get sort of a warmer base. And see how that looks like on the practice sheet. See sort of a little bit more of a yellow tone in there, brownish, golden, and it strikes the paper. And so now we'll take this from the edge of all the columns going back on both sides. So we even need probably to draw a line over here that links the back side of the columns, which will go parallel to the front. So right about here, that's where the grass starts and it works its way to the horizon line. So back there, we use the, the pointed brush to make sure we control the movement there because it's going to go from here to the stone-based drive. So that's the lawn going around the back side of it. And then we also have the box come in the front of it and return on that side as well. So we'll have just a sliver of the grass shown up front here. Because as the car comes in, it returns and goes out in a parallel drive that takes you back out to the street. So now we'll have a very broad brush, make sure there's lots of water in the pool. And that will take the whole deeper tone of the lawn in the front. And that's well lit by the sun. So that's our, our base scheme here, except for the one color that is added to remain sort of um, less prominent as the living area. And that's the mechanical area, so to speak, for um, the housing of the cars, the dropping off of people. And so to make that sort of secondary player here, you know, the white skin is not used down there and it's a deeper, more forest green at the base. So it kind of washes out as just a dark gray here. It'll become more prominent in our drawing because we'll go back to color for it. So we can use the greens we've got there and add more of the shadow to it of our blue black to deepen up that green. And we'll check this tone out. Now we'll have a range of tones because even though it's completely covered in shade by the whole building, as the sun doesn't go down and strike that, except for maybe a little bit on the southern end here, the bottom section of it. Well, you're going to hold the same, same tone now. They're going to throw a shadow on top of it. So the zone that receives light is like the bottom third or quarter. So that will keep as the initial, initial tone we'll, we'll paint in now. And then later on, we won't hit that with the value. So we can check out the green for this and see if we like. Oh, let's see, actually, the first two greens we did. Maybe add a little bit more blue to it. There we go. Good. And now we'll simply come across this in, in vertical strokes because it's actually panels of green material with deep fenestration cut into it in a vertical method. And this simply then runs all the way down towards the front of the home as people drive in off the street.
Well, that's sort of the start and our base for it. But now the matter is just like the other media we've used to date, you just simply layer in more and more of the value and detail. So assuming now we're probably at the 30 to 40% of value, we simply do the same types of aspects of painting more into it with the intention of having less and less attention as we move to the higher depths of value, the stronger numbers. So one of the first things that I want to do to kind of complete our base image here is to come in and do a deeper aspect of the growth that's sort of the under undercarriage of the forest. So the bushes and shrubs are at the base are oftentimes a deeper green here. So you can take that element and come where the lawn sort of meets the forest back here and put that value in. So it shares that horizontal method of what the cars drive around beneath the home. And then continues out toward the front. And that kind of random brush stroke with the ponds of water and how the color will saturate in certain areas and others kind of lends itself to being vegetative. So it, it's a quick way with this type of media to get the essence of nature without spending a lot of time on it. Okay, now we'll come back in and do some cast shadows or deeper types of blues. So return to our blue, blue pool over here. Now we're simply going to go back into what we started with initially with the home and accentuate some of the corners and know that we know that nothing is actually a pure movement of light across it. It's always shifting back and forth. So make sure this is nice and liquidy, saucy, so it still remains transparent to it. Never go straight pigment now on top. Always have the water lighten it up for you. Double check on your tone, so it's still in the same range. And now we're going to come to uh, certain zones where there's a movement of light that's cast across the planes. One of them's up here where there's a throw of shadow cast by this on this element, which kind of cuts down on a diagonal. So we can take that whole pattern in there and add another layer of value for that cast shadow. And then I'll show the depth between the corner turret shape and then the parallel wall adjacent to it. And because the light of the outside here, it's the same plane as on the inside that's facing this way, but this is actually getting light reflected or bounced back on it from the whole atmosphere outside. There's a lot less on the inside. So all of our interior blue planes we've done so far can go darker. So we separate them in secondary tone. And in particular, the ones that really adjacent to some of the outside light hitting the ramp that takes you up to the upper level, it's more impactful because it's adjacent to an exterior white. Same is true for these over here, is it's gonna be darkest in this corner because it's trapped by the white of the building, but as the light bounces around in the patio space, it becomes a little bit brighter. So we'll come back to this and hit the right panel another time once these set up to move light being darkest here and then becoming lighter and lighter as it moves across that plane inside the patio space. Uh, we see an interior wall here and the ceiling's a little bit brighter from this viewpoint. So we'll keep the top a bit lighter. And then because of the backdrop, we want this to become a little more potently dark adjacent to it.
and then also the entire underside of that white will have another value laid over it. Now, a little point of reference here, we'll detail this out now and we'll keep hitting it as we get deeper and deeper with value is all the pelotes are actually cylindrical. They're actually round columns. So what we want to do to exercise that idea of them being round, even if they're lit by the sun, they're going to have a tail of, of, of cast shadow that's going to move kind of hyperbolically where the shadow starts right where it meets the building and then curls back on an angle to the opposite side of it. So we, that little bit of movement across the curve will create the sense of these being round. And then we're going to take a very fine point and come on this side of the whites and show that the back side starts to show on this edge. Just the lightest hint, certainly on the ones that are closest to us, that the left side is darker than the right side. And then when the columns get really thin in the distance, it's hard to actually pull that off. So just leave them as a solid tone. And now we'll take our, our shadow line and we'll go into the vegetation and show some tiers of movement in the planes of the trees in the back. Because right now they read as a horizontal, or excuse me, a vertical plane because there's no change in them. So we want to come down to some of the lower areas and simply say that we know the building casts a shadow on them, then we'll break that up and have it be more tree-like as it steps away from the building. Make sure that dark goes right into the corner. Through the glaze and we see it over here. And again, it gives us an excuse to take some value right to the edges of the building and make the contrast stronger. So we want to push the zero of the white of the skin of the building towards deeper 50, 60, 70% value to make it come off the page a bit. And right at the tip, you could set a little definition of the edge of the trees hitting the sky. And now we'll do the same with the rotunda of green that wraps around here, because obviously the underside that faces this edge receives the least amount of light, and we see that volume going back in space. And we'll take our blue and simply wash that across this skin now. So each incremental layer now of value, we're simply trying to pull out some of the detail of the home as time allows. Come back in the blue and realize that the underside of the wall that's cut open for this little ornamental window at the top comes to a certain point. And when that sets up, we'll draw that down a little bit on this side as it casts a shadow on itself.
And now we'll start to nuance some of the interiors because right now it's there's a wall, the living space that shelters the kitchen, turns around the corner there, which faces the opposite direction. So there is a sort of an open space that flows between all the spaces. And yet sort of visually, there's always a disconnect from an interior wall that separates and kind of creates individual zones for the functions. But the light moves across there. So it would be potentially stronger right at the edge of that wall. and then deeper at the top of it as less light hits that interior white wall. You see how dark we're getting, even though it's a, a white wall. And that's the light cannot penetrate that deep. So you start to articulate some of that change in, in um, the wall planes inside. And so here's where that room turns the corner and heads out toward the patio space. There's a change in the value there. And we'll come back towards the end when this is all set and we'll do our dry cut of black for all the frames for the sashes for the windows. And coming back over to some smaller areas now, right toward this corner of the third window over here, it's deepest blue black. And again, parts of this interior ceiling are stronger. So this area is going over the, the blacks that are in the distance, they lose a lot of their sensitivity to the light, so they end up appearing even stronger than some of the ones that are closer to us because it all collapses into space. And then we'll probably take the whole underside of this green wall and make the dark third of it seem deeper in tone. And now what we'll do is we'll take a little bit of a method of assuming that if the light is coming down on this side, it's going to hit to the corner of the building and throw a shadow line on the grass area that's ever so slight. It will help sit the building down. So that would come down, pick an angle of the sun's orientation at that point, and then project out and take that back to the horizon line a certain depth. And that'll return from this corner. So it gives us a chance to put some of the value now on our lower plane. So we can wash that level of the grass now. So the cash shadow below is the partner of the shade side that we're drawing on. That'll come to a triangulated point right where the first corner of the shade hits the ground. And now because it's it's a stone material there, which is a little bit brighter than the, the green of the grass. We could simply sort of water down some of that same tone and take it over the stone area because that's in complete shadow as well, shade and shadow. So we'll eliminate that from being as strong as the product as the white material of the skin that's seen the sunlight. So that I'll drop that down a bit. Now we're going to come over to these columns on the right that do receive full sun. And they're also going to have a projection of a, a shadow on the ground plane. And this will help them kind of reach the ground and then turn 90 degrees into space. So all of these columns, when they come down and meet our final point here, they're going to hit that point and then vanish back to our horizon line with the cast shadow. So one, two, three, and four. And that goes all the way back until that underside comes down here and hits the projection of how high that sun is, might come down and cast a shadow at the base, or if, it, if it's low enough, if it's earlier in the morning, it'll take that shadow line all the way back to the skin of the architecture. So this column's going to come and hit a line of shadow cast on the building. But more importantly for us, is we simply want to line it out 
on that drive that wraps around the building first. So a real fine line way, just really quickly kind of runs across here and shows these columns seated on the ground. And that'll help kind of get the idea of projected light and have the building have its uh, relative relationship between light, dark, shade, and shadow. The last couple of few steps are to go back to your residual pools of shade and shadow and come back to moving your 60% dark to 70 and 80 and 90. So we'll tighten this up and make the darker is dark, which makes the residual whites brighter. So it's really a bit more of you assessing what you've got so far and how far you want to push it one way or another. It may be important, since this is our most important corner, the contrast between those could be stronger. So if you make another really sort of very white wash, or excuse me, wet wash out of the shade area, and then take it up to our corner again, and put all the pigment right at that edge. And then simply go back to the water pool and come up with just clean water and wipe that to the left. That'll hold that edge a little bit more for you. Same as two probably with the backside of our two rotunds up here, the hemisphere shapes out in space, go right to their corner where it needs to be darkest. Instead of having a line at the edge of that shadow line, go to the water pond and work it over to the side. And maybe what we'll do to enhance the transparency of this, we'll go to the green of our background forest and continue it within that window shed. So we see it pass behind that as well. So it's passing by over here, nice and dark. And now time to go on the fenestration and know that the darkest part of any forested area is right at the base where it meets the ground. So we'll come to a marriage of our shadow with our earlier greens and bring that right down to that horizon line. And that'll sit that whole field down for us. And we want to pick that back up at the other side of the building over here. So right where our building ends, it's brighter than the forest beyond it. We can then really frame our columns so they remain ultimately white for us. So what Corbusier accomplished here is almost like a, a sacred sense of the purpose of the home, which is universal then. It's not tied to a region, to a climate, to a people, to a political stand. It's just another working tool for mankind. There's an act of sort of cleansing or health-giving properties of the sun with the solarium and the roof so that it's an intentional way to really change the relationship of a homeowner to the site and to the natural world. And we'll push some more value right to this corner.
And now as it sets up, you can go to your number five or some of the key aspects of what's closest to us around the principal third of the sketch, which is really close and can have the most definition to it. And you can find those lines that really hold space beyond them. So for instance, the top of our turret up here against the sky is a very dominant line of dark. To make that black a little more potent up there. See if I've got a secondary one. Three, <clears throat> three and five, and five. And then with the flat plane, that one also can be stronger. And the whole run aspect here right across the space. Well, in that definition. And obviously, probably these three columns at the corner, certainly they're left edge by the shade side. Here you can take a little bit of a rotund movement at the top to show how that arc of that column meets the base of the building. Just to finalize that little bit of nuance to shape the rotund quality of the columns. Maybe at the base as well as it meets the grass. And once the ones in the foreground are done well, it's just projected on the ones in the rear. Now come to the left side, which is against the sun, opposite the sun and pull those lines down on the ones that are closest to us because it's a finer line in the distance and not necessary. And then where the fenestration opens up, that's a key edge to create space on that side. The underside looking through into the inside space and out the other. Street side, the edge of the garage turnaround on both sides, the underside facing the forest. These are all the dominant lines that just need to be a little more powerful to address the edges of the value. So that's where we tried to push all of our value to those corners or edges that hold space beyond edge of this room with the windows start again. And then maybe some naturalistic lines right at the base of the forest, that line where the deep green touches the lighter grass green. And pull that through to the backside. And now, even though it's going to be the same tone down beneath, we could shape some of the perforations of glazing through here. So, for instance, right at the spine here where it rotates, on either side are panels that show the doorway and the entryway in. So there is some subtle line work there, which is glazed. And it takes you to a dark space, so it's not going to be a brighter thing. But there, there are elements which shape around and give a sense of movement along this as it wraps around that turning radius of the automobile. And then maybe coming back to your drafting utensil with this line work because it's fairly intricate with the windows. We want to go to the inside of these and show that is a stronger line. And 
the space that goes up and underneath that on both planes here. And now to end it, we just want to use the fine point brush and to get a fairly dry wash now. So we can go to our, our shade wash. We've got residual here of some of the blue black and maybe turn it a bit more black than blue. Add some more black to it to make sure it's basically more pigment based. You don't need much of a pool. It's going to cover a lot of area in our window trim, the actual mullions of the window, the structure for the glazing. So then uh, dry out your pen, your pen, excuse me, your brush on the paper. So it's not holding residual water. So now the, the bristles are dry. And now when they come into the pool of paint for that deep sort of um, black blue, you get mostly paint there and it works more like a pen would rather than a brush. We want to come to those encasement areas for the windows and turn those to black. And they'll have little bits of color in there too as they reflect light. So don't worry about being a perfect black the whole way. We'll simply run that across. And show that line work, take it on the other side, do the same thing. So these factory sash industrial windows then become commonplace in Corbu's architecture. That was the base too. There's a ribbon at the bed at the bottom. And we just want to make it certainly darker than the white wall, but just an effort to be intentional with the idea of these horizontal banding is one of the five points. And then some of the vertical sashes that, that frame the window are structural for the windows themselves are stronger and thicker than some of the thinner ones that show where sections of glass are moving, where they're moving horizontally across the skin. And so that helps give a little more prominence to that as a key element across these five points here. There you go. Well, that should be enough there. Uh, we'll come back in and make sure some of the earlier line work been connected. And because the rest of the site is fairly colorful around it with the greens, there's probably no need to put in the sky. It could be sort of a, a milky white sky and don't distract from what we got established so far. And then maybe with a thinner, maybe a three point, come back in to right where the column meets the grass and show a little bit of the movement of the edge of the grass there at the base. there is a change in material between the shadow along the grass and then the stone base of the driveway.
And in 1965, Villa Savoy became the first modernist building to be designated as a historical monument in France. <laughs> 